to talk about the critical care piece in the next slide. Okay, so really, uh, when you've done the, the glorious stuff, the fancy stuff in the OR and in the cath labs, that's when you come to the, uh, the real, where uh, you can really uh, impact how your patient will do or not do well. So you can really make a break a ca your case, and your patient can do fabulous in cath labs and have great surgery, but if this critical care team is not aligned with you, if both of you all don't have the same approach, that's where the patient will crumple, and that's where some, some of the things, the bad outcomes will happen. And from a patient perspective-wise, it's really about how the overall care of the patient happens. So it's not necessarily only limited to cath labs or the OR-wise, IC has to be aligned. So very common in your case, when find the what, but did the patient really survive post-operative complication? If they have a lot of blood transfusion, if they have bleeding, if they go into renal failure, respiratory failure, or any stroke, well, from a patient perspective, if they went to the hospital for a, for a surgery, and they have a negative outcome. So it's the whole continuum of care which is very relevant. All of you, and if you go around all over the country, everybody in the world will tell you that our patient is the sickest. I'm yet to meet a hospital or a surgeon or an or intensivist or cardiologist who said they've got easy patients. I'm still looking for that in the hospital. But everybody, they say we are the worst. We have got the worst patient. So some of the factors, all of these factors with the elderly patient, redo operation, redo a lot of metabolic syndrome, a lot of comorbidity, they're walking in. And remember, when you, uh, the more common age is 75 to 90. 90 is not necessarily a big deal nowadays. And depending on the location you start, so you know, human body was made to a certain thing, but we're really stretching the limits. Not only that, that you're dealing with a lot of these complicated, multi-risk patients, but you or us, we all are held accountable to a lot of public reporting, a lot of government mandates, a lot of outcome measurements. So everything is being measured in outcomes. So whether we feel it's fair or not fair, we're we judge in a way, and that can affect your payment, your institution reputation, your reputation, and everything. So these are not trivial things. So for example, if your case you know, goes into renal failure, that's a ding against you and an institution. If it goes into a respiratory failure or get a lot of blood, that's a gain. So all of these things are playing. So we have to be cognizant about all the overall care of the patient. We can't be a fact fragmented care. We have to all think in a team-based care and everything. So perioperative MI, bleeding, these are some of the key issues. DVT has been talked about. Ultrasound is part and parcel, you know, in, uh, for uh, critical care, especially with uh, whether it's line access or fast exam. A thoracic uh, ultrasound, that's particularly routine-wise. And then I want to take a, <coughs> a brief uh, issue about blood pressure management. And I can tell you that blood pressure, especially if it's hypertensive, you always have to make sure before you start jumping on the drip is that if the patient is under anesthetic or sedated in the ICU, is to make sure the patient's adequately pain-treated and is not very awake or because that can make an effect. And when you're treating blood pressure, always control the heart rate first. Don't go for a drip until you've got the heart rate control. You know, so that's a very paramount thing. And once you control the heart rate, once you assure the pain and agitation are not playing a role, then you can think of either venodilator or arterial dilator. Venodilator is really is nitroglycerin. It's, a, it's really a, a not, a, not a very good uh, antihypertensive, but it can play some role. But more often than not, arterial dilator can be done. But again, remember, you gotta take care of the pain, you gotta take care of the sedation issue, and you gotta control the heart rate before you do all of this stuff wise. So, blood transfusion. So, let me ask you the, generally to all of you at what hemoglobin would you give blood to a patient? How many will give blood to a patient who's a hemoglobin nine? You can raise your hands. How many will give at eight? Okay. How many will give at seven? Okay. All right. When would you give blood to a person whose hemoglobin is 7.5? When, when would you be okay with giving blood? So if they're requiring inotropin pressors, or they're having an acute MI, or they're actively bleeding, these are the three things in which data will actively support you to give blood, okay? So that's a key thing why. So these are the three indications, because if you're requiring Inotropin pressors to maintain hemodynamic stability, then it's okay to get the hemoglobin, give a unit of blood beyond seven. So that's that's a key point to remember. Appropriate DVD prophylaxis is very key thing. Is it's to make sure 
on, you know, what we're learning, and I can tell you as an institution, is that, you know, just because you order SCTs, don't assume they're on the patient. Don't assume the patient is using it also, so please verify that front point. Respiratory management, uh, key outcomes in respiratory failure is really, is fluid management. In the OR and ICU, and multiple studies have shown that too much fluid overload or reactive resuscitation can have a negative impact. Blood component, blood, if you're bleeding a lot, of, your patient's bleeding a lot, and you get, end up giving a lot of blood products, you can affect your negative on your lungs. And again, people talk about classic trolley, transfusion related acute lung injury. More often than not, it's a delayed trolley, which manifests up to six to 72 hours. And these are, again, mobilize the patient, get them to work. That's a key thing. Hospital infections, you know, as surgical site infection, they're all going to impact and can impact with that. This is a, you know, you can have this handout, all these steps which are done, and that play an active role. Warming with the patient, you know, pre upping and again, OR has to be a place, or a cat lab has to be placed when people are not walking back and forth, back and forth. So this is a CDC checklist. It's a lot of verbiage in there, but the two major factor is put the line in the appropriate patient, and we're putting line as a full body drape, not a half, not a thing wise. And when you prep the patient, let the chlorohexidine dry for 30 seconds. If you don't let it dry, it doesn't work. Most of them not, people will rub it and then start working on it. No, let it dry. So that's a very key factor. And the other key point I want to remind is, when we were very good at putting lines in there, but we are not very good at getting lines out. Okay, so the key to remember is, you know, what is the real reason to, get, to keep the center line? Is it convenience? Is it comfort? Or is it really true patient management why? So please get those lines out. If you don't get the lines out, no matter what you do, they will get, and again, mind away. The new outcome measure is that the, uh, if a patient gets a central infections within the first seven day of insertion, the ding goes to the team which is inserting the line, not the management team wise. It used to be three days, now it's seven days. So if you know, so again, that's a key thing. Remember, if you put a central line in, they get a central infection, for seven days you're gonna get ding. All of these things, again, central infection, can contribute up to $30,000 to the cost of care, and there's a negative out outcome from every angle wise. Then your patient cannot go to the next place. They cannot get discharged from the ICU floor or, or home or anything. So that's a very key thing to remember. Sepsis, again, why am I mentioning? Because all the patients that we're dealing with are very high risk of getting sepsis. And again, sepsis is becoming a core measure, just like uh, MI core measure, heart failure core measure. This is a core measure. You will see these patients either in the ED, or acute care floor, they may, can get confused, they can have a temperature, they can have a heart rate, they can have breathing issue wise. So not everybody would be spiking 100, 200, but it can be combination. One of the key things we learn is, then elderly patient population, the first sign of sepsis was confused patient. Okay, so that, and when you are identifying patient with sepsis, a severe sepsis, you gotta do a couple of key things in the first six hours. These are government mandated thing is, A, make sure you've drawn blood culture and start antibiotics. All literature is shown, of all the outcome measure, early delivery of antibiotics within one hour is the key determining factor in outcomes and mortality. So get the culture done, get the antibiotic in, send a lactic acid immediately, start some fluid. And when you're starting fluid and starting antibiotics, don't count on one peripheral IVs. You gotta have to have two at least, because you gotta undone this. And then repeat all the lactic acid. So these are some things which all of us are gonna be highly uncomfortable. Another factor which I like to kind of expand is enhanced recovery after anesthesia. All this, everybody's focusing on how do we mobilize. By the way, this started about 17, 15, 17 years ago in Scotland, and now worldwide it is how it's being. That every case should be like looked upon how do you engage the patients, their families, the preoperative area, the anesthesiologists, the intensivists, the nurses on the PACU, on the floor, in mobilizing and moving patients faster and optimizing patients so they're in a better shape when they go to the OR, minimizing flu, narcotics, and all this stuff, transfusion, getting tubes out of the patient in a timely fashion, whether it's Foley, chest tube, or anything like that, and making them, mock them. And then one of the bedrock of all of this thing is minimizing narcotic use. If you look at any structure, right, there's a huge opioid pandemic all over, the, all over the country, so, and we have done some work, we have got a very good work done on thoracic surgical patients, and we are able to reduce are scheduled to narcotic uh, or discharge home by 90%. So key points, it's all about communication. You gotta talk. It's not what you end up doing in a cath lab or an OR. If you don't communicate and collaborate with the critical team, it's not gonna work. 
Steam rope will make a big difference. Intraoperative fluid, blood, hemodynamics, all of this in play, and direct reporting. And remember, or if the patient doesn't do well, nobody says that, hey, the anesthesiologist was great or the surgeon was great. They said, well, I didn't do well in the hospital. So the key thing really is we all are held accountable. If the patient does well, we all do well. And whether it's infection, DVT, MIs, and all the stuff, it's all sink and swim wise. So that's a key point I wanted to remember that. 